The wind that moves across the North China Plain today still carries silt from far-off deserts, the same dust that once fell softly over a spring-fed hollow near the city of Xuchang. In that shallow basin, where Ice Age herds nosed for water and hunters watched them, two human skulls lay hidden for more than a hundred thousand years. When they were finally coaxed from the sediments, first one, then another over several years, researchers realized they were looking at something extraordinary. The crania from Xuchang preserve a brain case that is unmistakably archaic, yet curiously familiar. The back of the head swells into a bun. The vault is long and low, the brow strong, the bones thick. For anyone who knows Neanderthal anatomy, those details are a dead ringer. Several morphometric studies conducted by an international group of scientists concluded that these skulls, Xuchang I and Xuchang II, sit statistically closest to Neanderthals and not Denisovans or modern humans. The Xuchang skulls are not famous in the public imagination, but they deserve to be. They expand the human story eastward with startling clarity, showing that the traits we once thought rooted in the limestone caves of France and the Rhine also appear deep in the heart of China. Their age places them in a climatic window, when grasslands ran unbroken from the Carpathians to the Yellow River, and when pulses of warmth and moisture remade the deserts of Central Asia into stepping stones rather than walls. Put together, the evidence opens a bold possibility that a population carrying Neanderthal hallmarks pushed across Eurasia during a hospitable interglacial reached North China and there met local archaic people, relatives of the Denisovans, producing a hybrid mosaic recorded in bone. The Xuchang site sits in Henan province, not far from the Yellow River's ancient channels. In Pleistocene time this was a corridor, herds moving between uplands and lowlands, Hunters following rivers where flint nodules could be pried from banks. Freshwater springs pooling in the lowest. Excavations in the spring basin exposed a busy palimpsest of activity. Cut-marked animal bones, stone artifacts, and embedded among them the fragile arcs and plates of human skulls. The pieces were mapped and lifted with surgical operation, then scanned, mirrored, and fit into digital reconstructions that allow the crania to be viewed from every angle. In those models, it is the posterior view that makes seasoned paleoanthropologists sit up. The rear of the vault is rounded and projects backward. A shallow depression rides above the nuchal lines. The lateral walls sweep toward a pentagonal outline. One could place a silhouette of La Ferrassi or La Chapelle au Saint behind the Xuchang reconstruction, and despite differences in detail, feel the rhyme. This is not a simple case of look-alike. Neanderthals are not defined by a single trait but by a constellation of features that co-occur with high frequency. An occipital bun, a long, low vault with mid-facial projection. A particular pattern of inner ear canals, strong brow ridges that sweep across the frontal bone and robust cranial bases. Many fossils show some of these, few show them all. What is striking at Xuchang is how many of the Neanderthal signatures cluster, especially in the posterior cranium, the very region that tends to be most conservative and most telling. The bun is there. So is the supraniac fossa, a distinctive oval depression on the back of the skull, a trait strongly associated with Neanderthals. The vault profile is not modern. It is archaic, low and long. Add in the thick cranial bone and large estimated brain size, well within the upper range seen in late Stone Age humans, and the crania begin to read like Neanderthal kin. Dating cements the story. The sediments encasing the skulls belong to late marine isotope stage 5, a warm period spanning roughly 125,000 to 100,000 years ago. In North China, this warm period is written in soils, lakes and dunes, the big monsoon soils of the lowest plateau formed when summers were stronger and wetter. Pliers on the northern deserts held more water, steppe expanded across the Piedmont. In other words, it was a time when barriers softened. Climate models and proxies agree that westerly winds shifted and weakened. The East Asian summer monsoon pushed north, and ecological belts blurred along a broad trans-Eurasian band. If ever there was a window for populations to move east out of Central and Eastern Europe, across Kazakhstan and Mongolia, and into the basins of North China, this would be it. 
We tend to picture Neanderthals penned in by mountains and ice, their world a core territory in Europe and the Caucasus. That picture, sharpened by early 20th century discoveries, was never the whole story. Over the last two decades, bones and genes have steadily pulled Neanderthals outward. They were in the Levant intermittently for at least 130,000 years. They occupied the Altai Mountains of southern Siberia, where archaeologists recovered a phalanx that yielded classic Neanderthal DNA. They left genetic traces in modern people far beyond Europe, with East Asians actually carrying slightly more Neanderthal DNA on average than Europeans. All of that points to a population that was mobile, resilient, and capable of occupying a broad climatic envelope. Against that backdrop, the Shuchang Crania stop feeling improbable and start feeling inevitable. If Neanderthal-related groups could reach the Altai, why should they not ride the step farther east when the weather allowed? Geography also helps the theory. Draw a line from the Altai to the North China Plain, and you thread the Dzungarian Gate, skim the Gobi, and drop into the river webs that feed the Yellow River. During the warm period, parts of that route were greener than they are today, sustained by pluvial phases that left shorelines on closed basin lakes from Kazakhstan to Inner Mongolia. The arid corridor that often divides western and eastern Eurasia was punctured by seasonal grasslands and marshes. Herds of steppe bison, horses and wild asses would have found grazable waypoints. Hunters who knew their movements could follow without starving. It is not far-fetched to imagine a lineage of Neanderthal-like humans pushing along this belt in pulses, perhaps a few hundred at a time, scattering, regrouping, merging with locals, leaving their traits in skulls like those at Xuchang. The late Middle and early late Pleistocene fossil record of East Asia is rich in skulls that are neither fully Neanderthal nor fully modern. Dali, Jinyushan, Maba and Harbin, the Dragon Man farther northeast, the so-called archaic skulls, present a mosaic. Big vaults, thick bones, flattened mid-faces, wide zygomatic arches, and idiosyncratic details in the base. They have long been interpreted as evidence for regionally continuous populations in China that were connected to, yet distinct from, Western Eurasia. When geneticists finally pulled ancient DNA from a finger bone in the Altai and named the group Denisovans, the Chinese record suddenly had a plausible genomic counterpart. Later, mineralized proteins from a jaw on the Tibetan plateau confirmed Denisovan affinity at high altitude. This is the world the Xuchang people stepped into, a landscape inhabited by Denisovan-related groups, some living in the lowlands, some on the plateau, all leaving faint genetic fingerprints in modern populations from Oceania to the Americas. If Neanderthal-related humans reached North China during this time, it would have been impossible for them not to meet the locals. The archaeological record in the region hints at know-how that travelled. Levalois flaking, a prepared core technology long associated with Neanderthals in the West, appears intermittently in North China around 100,000 years ago. The presence of the technique here does not prove Neanderthals, but it reminds us that technological ideas, like people, can cross the continent. At Xuchang, stone artifacts and animal bones with cut marks speak to persistent occupation around springs over long spans of time. The humans who drank at those pools may have dressed in hides against winter cold, butchered horse and deer at the water's edge, and watched migrating herds from the reeds. Whether their words carried the cadence of Western cousins or of Eastern archaics, they almost certainly heard each other. However, it is bone, not DNA, makes the Xuchang case, so caution is warranted. Ancient DNA rarely survives in the warm, seasonal soils of eastern China. But anatomy is not silent. The Supraniac fossa is a classic Neanderthal signature, common in that lineage and rare elsewhere. The occipital bun, while not unique to Neanderthals, is developed in them in a characteristic way, helping accommodate their large brain volumes and peculiar vault shape. The combination of a bun and supraniac fossa in a late Pleistocene skull from China is startling precisely because those features co-occur regularly in Neanderthals. Add the overall long, low shape of the brain case and the robust lateral walls, and the crania align comfortably with Western Neanderthal variation in the back of the head, even as other regions retain a more East Asian archaic look. 
That pattern, the posterior vault western, the anterior region local, is exactly what one might expect in a hybrid population after several generations of interbreeding. Genetics tell us such marriages happened. In the Altai, a bone nicknamed Denny belonged to a teenage girl whose mother was Neanderthal and father Denisovan. At Denisova Cave, the occupation layers themselves overlap, and the genomes recovered from the site show repeated episodes of interaction between the two groups across time. East Asians today carry both Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA, the latter patchier but significant along Southeast Asian and Oceanian islands. Taken together, the genomic record now makes Neanderthals met Denisovans less a hypothesis than fact. The open question is where and how often the Xuchang skulls add a candidate. Around 100,000 years ago, somewhere on the plains and basins of North China, people with Neanderthal-like skulls met Denisovan-related people and mixed. The result was a community whose bones carried the very mosaic scene at Xuchang. Climate models help us understand why the meeting might have happened then. The warm period unfolded in pulses, a particularly warm peak at about 125,000 years ago, followed by slightly cooler, then warmer intervals before Earth tipped back toward glaciation. In northern China, those shifts register as soil and dust in the lowest. When summers were strong, soils formed and steppes spread. When winters tightened, dunes marched and dust blew. The Xuchang skulls date to one of the warm pulses when monsoon rains reached north and the deserts retreated. Modelled precipitation increases of even a few tens of millimetres across the Gobi and the Hexi Corridor would have been enough to stitch together seasonal pastures and ephemeral wetlands, opening a living thread from the Altai to Henan. In that kind of year-to-year -year variability, mobile hunter-gatherers push their ranges, follow herds into new wintering grounds and test unfamiliar river crossings. Over a few generations, populations can shift hundreds of kilometres without any sense of intentional migration. They simply live where food is viable. The Xuchang skulls look like the fossilised outcome of those generations. What did life look like for these people? The skulls are large, suggesting massive brains. Their owners stood within the range of Neanderthals and early modern humans, women around five foot two, men around five foot seven or eight, robustly built, muscled by winter hunger and the work of hauling game. Winters during this time in North China could be raw, with dust storms, freezing nights and occasional snow. Summers were warm and wet, the plains green with grasses and poplars edging streams. Clothing would not have been a luxury. Scrapers and awls found at sites of similar age speak to hide working. The seams of stitched skins trap warmth as effectively as any modern parka. Groups probably ranged widely along rivers, camping in windbreaks, returning to springs in dry months, and spreading out when rains came. To call the Xuchang skulls the first Neanderthals in China would be a headline-friendly simplification. Scientific care demands hedges. The crania are late Pleistocene and archaic. They present a suite of Neanderthal-like traits, particularly in the occipital region. They also retain features common in East Asian archaic fossils. In the absence of DNA, assigning them to Neanderthals sensu stricto would be premature. But the thrust of the discovery is in spirit even more exciting than a tidy label. Su Chang shows that the Neanderthal story is not a Western European story with an Eastern footnote. It is a continental story. It shows that the Denisovan story is not confined to a single Siberian cave and a Tibetan jaw, but bleeds onto the plains where hybrid communities could have formed and thrived. It shows that the great grassland belt of Eurasia, so often treated as a barrier, was, in warm phases, a bridge. There is a deeper significance as well. For decades, East Asian fossils were read through a frame of regional continuity, sometimes set in opposition to a replacement model from Africa. Genetics has since taught us that human history is neither pure continuity nor pure replacement. It is braiding. Modern people in East Asia carry ancestry from multiple streams. An African-born modern human core, pulses of Neanderthal DNA from contacts somewhere in the Near East and later in Eurasia, and Denisovan pieces that entered in multiple places and times. 
The Xuchang skulls capture that braiding physically. You can almost see the strands in their curves, a back of the head shaped by a Western lineage, a face more at home among Chinese archaics, the whole fused into a person who drank at springs and watched horses throw light spray into the wind. That is a more human story than any tidy map arrow. Future work will sharpen the picture. If proteins can be coaxed from the bones, they may place the skulls on the Denisovan Neanderthal modern spectrum with more precision. If a scrap of ancient DNA hides in a petrous bone, we may yet read a genome that says outright what the anatomy implies. New surveys across the Gansu Ningxia Corridor and the northern Lois Plateau, regions poised along the steppe edge, may turn up campsites with bone tools, ornaments or hearths that mark sustained communities rather than quick stopovers. And climate reconstructions will refine our sense of when the corridor opened and closed, perhaps revealing multiple pulses of movement into North China 120,000 to 100,000 years ago, rather than a single event. Each data point will test a proposition the skulls have put on the table. That Neanderthal-related people reached China, met Denisovan-related people, and left descendants whose heads carried the stamp of both. It is tempting to imagine a winter day on the plain near Xuchang, at the edge of one of those warm pulses. A small group picks its way toward the spring. They know this place and pass their childhoods here. Among them walks a woman whose mother's people came from far to the west, though she does not know that name, and whose father's kin root deeper in the soils of the east. To her, they are simply family. She carries a child on her hip and a flake in her pouch, napped from a prepared core that someone taught her to shape on a long walk across the grasslands. At the spring, the hunters crouch and point to tracks in the mud. The woman shifts the child to her other hip and laughs at something a boy says. In that laugh, in the tilt of her head, in the unseen inner ear canals that balance her gaze, the Neanderthal and the Denisovan and the local archaic are already fused. Her bones, had they been preserved, might have looked a little like the Xuchang skulls. We often anchor human history to continents and borders, but our ancestors were most at home in the seams, river corridors and seasonal pathways that opened and closed with climate. The Xuchang skulls come from such a seam, both in place and in time. They mark a moment when climate eased the passage across northern Asia, when people who carried a western signature in the back of the head could stand at a Chinese spring and see themselves reflected. In their anatomy, we glimpse a groundbreaking possibility that Neanderthals, or a population very close to them, once walked the North China Plain, and in that walk helped write the complicated genetic overture now playing in billions of living people. That is not just a footnote to European prehistory. It is a new chapter in Asia's deep past, and in ours. Thank you for watching.